Hey, hey. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Today, I want to talk about neo hermetic traditions, magical traditions, the traditions of the West, the good ones, the bad ones, and the ones that are in between. Because there's this thing, you know, the lineage of the West is very interesting. It had to have gone underground. And some of the lineages may or may not be, uh, how should I put this, legitimate? But even the ones that aren't still have uh, remnants, still have aspects of real tradition, of real initiation, of real magic in them. Even though you do get certain neo-hermetic schools that are kind of like, you know, well, what's what's your source? And the, it's like my source, I made it up. Like that's a lot of <laughs> a lot of the rituals. I don't know, are constructed. Not re well now, not recent constructions. They're at least a hundred years old, and if it works, it works. So I wanna I wanna talk about them because it's like you know, what are we doing? What's our aim? What can you extract from these traditions? And one thing I've always liked doing is if you gain a system, so this may be a little bit more uh, on the advanced side, this little uh, talk. If you are able to get into a system or do a system or practice a system and then not necessarily move into another, but if you gain something from it, if you do develop yourself a little bit, you should be able to, on one level, look at other systems and not compare. Compare, you're not necessarily comparing, you're contrasting. The difference being comparing is what people do when, you know, they want to say which one's better than the other. Like, oh, well, you know, I don't like this fruit. I don't like these peaches that you have because I've eaten peaches from, you know, ages back from some... African country or from, or from New Zealand and they were ultra fresh and juicy and your peaches suck. I'm comparing them. I'm comparing this sunset to a sunset I've seen before and this one sucks. I'm comparing this to that. I'm comparing this, I don't know, ski slope. You know, you compare things to show which one's better and which one's worse. You're not necessarily wanting to compare. What you want to do is contrast where you place two things next to each other and you see what arises through the differences. You're not looking for what's similar and saying this, they're similar and then this is, and you're tier ranking them, it's black and white. You're putting black and white next to each other and with the way they mold and fold into each other, the contrast creates an image. So out of contrasting different systems, we can see certain things that arise. We can gain, because what, what are we looking for? We're looking for the principles that are universal. We're looking for uh, a meta system, really. And a meta system will have, you know, meta aims or a, a goal or a raison d'etre, uh -huh -huh, you know, that kind of thing. So what are we going to study? We're going to study three different traditions. First one is we're going to talk about the Golden Dawn. Now, the Golden Dawn <laughs> is an interesting system. That's one of the main ones. That's the, uh, what's your source for it? My source, I made it. No, they're, they're interesting. They're interesting. They started in the late 1800s, they collapsed, and then they became universal over the entire Anglosphere. So if you speak English and you practice magic, you've probably either done or know of Golden Dawn rituals. It's universal to the degree that if you, you know, if you join even other schools, like a, if you join a Celtic pagan school, the rituals will be golden dawn rituals with like a Celtic mythology paint jobbed over it or a Babylonian or a blah, 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 or a this or a that. The golden dawn system has become basically a backbone for, you know, the, a lot of the, a lot of the systems in the English speaking world, not the Western world, the English speaking, the Anglo sphere. Now, the Golden Dawn system is interesting. It appears to be, majority of it appears to be using visualization, using the imagination. And this, uh, I've come, I've kind of come to a certain head with images 
and visualizations in my own practice, really, and I'll, maybe I'll talk about that. But it's, the problem is, you need to have really a specific, you really need to have a good foundation to work with visualizations, to work with images, or else what? Or else delusion sets in and people go crazy. And this is, if you know those, like the Golden Dawn books, the huge, the usually people have either sixth edition or the seventh edition. But if you get the first edition of the Golden Dawn by Israel Regade, like the Falcon publication one with the, you know, the, the, the yellow, the gold and red kind of dust jacket, that edition has a bunch of essays by I Israel Regade in the beginning. And like one of them has like some weird name, it's in Latin, like Egoist Giganticus or something. <laughs> But basically in the, um, the essay, he's basically just talking and he basically says, if you do this work, you should see a psychiatrist. And he doesn't mean that you should stop doing the work. He said, no, 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 just you should see a psychiatrist as in, you know, Israel Regatta himself uh, studied psychology. He, stud he studied Freud and he studied a bit of Jung, didn't like Jung, and then uh, studied Wilhelm Reich. And he said this really helped him uh, kind of come to terms with things and balance himself, basically. And he said, if you don't do that, you just go crazy. And he said, he's seen it all again and again and again. People will come into the tradition, be very meek, you know, not have experienced anything, and they'll start doing practices and they'll experience one thing and immediately think that they're gods and human flesh and this and that, and they're Christ coming and they'll just go crazy and like leave or uh, do damage to even the school. And so he says, don't do that. You should get a foundation first. And so there is energy work. So of course there is the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, which really is more of a visualization thing, is a, an evoking thing. You're using divine names, you're using visualizations to have dominion over the elements. The elements that you have dominion over are of course, you know, the uh, forces, invisible forces in nature that are around us. You know, this is good preparation for ritual magic but it's also for those elements that are within us, you know, fire, our anger, our frustration, our impatience, our waters, our desires, our negative emotions, our, uh, the air, our thoughts, which can either be continuously churning and overthinking, or they can be, t they can turn back in ourselves and damage ourselves, melancholic thought, depression, um, self-pity, uh, and of course, earth, when it's uh, dry and squalid it's languishes it's laziness it's uh it doesn't move or it's very materialistic these attributes are the, ele uh, the elements in a negative polarity within us so the idea is having dominion over those elements or the negative elements we begin to develop the higher qualities i suppose the fire is courage you know the water is that adaptive capacity also you know the what do you call it the emotional capacity the emotional receptivity obviously balanced thought or uh, what do you call it not just balanced thought but a precise thought that allows you to cut through things and of course earth becomes a vigilance hard working nature like a gnome just chiseling away to, as out of mind you gain these attributes within yourself you become a more balanced person the more you're able to have dominion over the elements that constitute your personality. And of course, the elements have an energetic component. Once again, the elements mixed together are the ether, the etheric world. Uh, the elements mixed together help give, put certain qualities into our astral body, etc., etc., etc. So the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram, obviously, you know, something you should do, or at least an equivalent practice, like, you know, something like what Franz Baden teaches or whatever. Usually that's a constant. Uh, when you study systems all around the world, you'll notice the very first uh, technique or practice you're given is either something to do with breathing or attention or awareness. But in the West specifically, you know, they'll always, they'll teach you, you know, that as a first thing, like have an, do an awareness practice on, you know, your left hand or something, or uh, do this specific breathing exercise. But the next practice on from that is always like something to do with the four elements, pretty much. Or in the system somewhere, there'll be something about doing practices with the elements, four elements or five elements if you include ether. That's always there. And so that's in, you see that in the Golden Dawn, and then you see the next main thing that they do is, of course, the middle, middle pillar exercise. Uh, this exercise, once again, using visualizations, using divine names, but there's an energetic component where uh, energy rushes up, you should say, you could say, the middle pillar within us, which is our spine, 
We want to push fire up our spine and have our spine itself become a wand or the staff of the magician so that we can do magic in and of ourselves. But, you know, and there's a whole bunch of other things, implements and vestments and temple work and circumnambulations, and you can do group work or you can do it by yourself. And then there's degrees and degrees and degrees, and you go up these degrees, but where does it, once again, all end? What are you trying to do? And there's this one, if you get the big Israel Regade uh, tome, right at, not right at the end. I mean, there's a lot of things you do. There's divination, there's talisman making. There's, it's, it's literally an entire system in and of itself. And you can get many books. You can get the Chick and Tabitha, Circe wrote. So not Chick and Tab, not Chick and Tabitha. A guy called Chick and his wife, Tabitha. I think it's his wife. Cersero, they have the Initiate Yourself into the Golden Dawn book, which uh, supposedly, uh, I haven't read that one, but sup people ap approve of them online. Apparently they're, they're well regarded, at, at least in some circles. I mean, Golden Dawn, everyone. <laughs> There's some places where it's, sometimes it seems everybody hates each other, and then but no, everyone respects each other, but whatever. Um, and you can see there's lots of different lots of different people coming out of the works and talking about different rituals and how to do them but what's the end goal the part of the end goal or something that i would say stood out to me is in that book there's a book called sorry in israel regarding golden dawn there's a ritual towards the end called the bornless ritual and it's this interesting ritual and it can be used i've seen some people talk about it and say it's almost like a catch-all ritual you can use it for almost anything for uh getting a knowledge of a past life or f trying to find a buried treasure or some bullshit or doing this doing that you're basically what you're doing is you're summoning something you're summoning the high i think you're working with the holy guardian angel in this ritual and it's quite a nice ritual actually if you, you can just if you have the book you can just whip it out or you can find it online and people have different uh, interpretations on the ritual. Some pe on, online, some people, uh, no, I, I shouldn't say interpretations, it's like their own style. They've done the ritual and they've kind of cut off the fat or made it their own. Because it is good, it's a good ritual. But the thing about the, this that struck me is, this is, this is what you're trying to do. Because this is the perspective, and I'm not, I'm not saying that this is, you know, uh, this is what old Golden Dawn people think. But from, you could say, uh, the tradition or from where I'm coming from, what it looks like, what the human looks like is, you could say the human is an appendage to something greater. There is a being, there is a god, there is uh, something in the ontological realm. And that thing issues its essence into the world it emanates its es essence into the world and that essence of course forgetting itself is coated in a being body that grows up becomes a human and as we all know we live in a society and society and its norms permeate into us our friends group our family zodiacal influences uh, create this personality create this construct around us and those experiences are absorbed into the essence at death and that essence is reabsorbed into that thing that lives ontologically above us. So that thing above us is beyond good and evil. It has a completely different perspective of the world. It sees the world in a completely different way. That thing that lives above us, or that is eternal, that part of us that is eternal, that has a chronology outside of time and space, that thing, you know, would view a world war like leaves falling from a tree. It would have a completely different ethic, a completely different way of looking at the world. It's not, it wouldn't be irrational. It would be completely unrational or super rational. So there's not nothing, it's not illogical. There's just something super rational about it. It's beyond anything because uh, in a sense, it's all of, all of our past lives are all stored into that thing. It has the cognition and memory of all of those things. Almost think of it like, you know, this Oversoul is like the God Emperor of Dune. If you've read that book, that's actually, uh, you know, people have probably seen the movie now, but the whole thing about Dune is if, you know, if you have some guy who can see the future and he can see that if you have 
if you kill a million people here and to save 10 million people should you not only should you do it but if you do kill a million people and it saves billions of lives how would people look at you obviously they'd see you as a tyrant but you would know that you're a savior and so chronology in the dune universe they go off onto the like the fourth dune book by the time they get to the fourth dune book, book you have this guy the god emperor who can basically see so far into the future he can see the destruction of mankind and he basically just becomes a massive douchebag he becomes the ultimate tyrant or in his old words what does he say sorry in his own words what does he say he says i will teach humanity a lesson that even their bones will remember and it's like he is so tyrannical for 3,000 years that it genetically changes humans. And after the, is it 3,000 or like something, some ridiculous amount of time, like he lives for like 10,000 years. But it's like, you know, this, it's, he's this being, this force that just no one can dominate. And at the end, he kind of commits suicide using other people because he can see, he can see the future, he can see everything. No one can, no one can kill him, basically. He's like literally Giga Brain 5D chess uh you know he, he enjoys assassination attempts because that's the only thing that's actually like fun like oh something's breaking the norm mm. like but he basically dies and then after that no longer will humanity will will never accept a tyrant and he's like assured that even assured that the thing at the end of the universe that's uh, sorry the thing at the end of history which will destroy humanity will never come about or if it does come about it will never be able to uh, destroy the entire human race so it's just uh, anyway so that was a bit of a tangent there I'm not supposed to talk about dune but that mentality that mentality is the thing that exists above us and that thing loves us but it's a love outside of duality so you know when there's a drunk guy on the side of the street what's the most compassionate thing to do to, for him it would be to rip the fucking bottle out of his hands and tell him to not drink anymore but from his perspective we would look like a tyrant so this is the thing there is something above us that seemingly oppresses us but also loves us and also gifts us with certain natural qualities genius uh, inclinations even your innermost essential desire to practice magic or to walk the spiritual path comes from that thing and what we want to do is we want to connect with that to jack into that to fuse with that and so that in my mind is actually what the bornless ritual was originally created for or even maybe even the creators didn't even know what they were doing when they smashed together that ritual or uh, ripped out that ritual from wherever it came from but there is an essence there is a flavor in that ritual that leads towards that goal so you could say that's in a way that's the highest point of the golden dawn system or if you're training the golden dawn system and you may not even understand what why you're doing it you just have this inclination like i want to do that and maybe you know maybe you wanted to do anokian stuff or you wanted to work with talismans or you wanted to eventually get to the point where you can do their divination stuff really unbeknownst to even you subconsciously you're be, uh, there's like psychic forces within your subconscious that are pushing you towards that ritual towards trying to connect to that higher force that's the main goal i would say my perspective once again not a part of a golden dawn school not even really a part of their community just looking in from the outside that's what i see when i look at the golden dawn system and if you want to learn the golden dawn system go for it i would recommend because you can read you can buy israel regarde's book you can just you can buy all of his books or you know all, a bunch of other stuff you can buy you know 900 page books go through it all this book here circles of power by john michael greer 300 pages oh my god it's so simple and easy to read uh it, and it just has everything in it literally he it's a it's a crucible he's burnt down everything cut all of the fat off <laughs> you know israel regarde his book is poetry this is a uh, you know golden dawn poetry this is golden dawn haiku he's cut everything down made it short and let me just go through some of the chapter uh, the titles of the chapters you know so uh, part one i don't know if you can see that there principles of ritual magic 
natural uh, the nature of ritual magic magical macrocosm microcosm tools of ritual magic he goes through it all and then down the bottom here or he goes through a bunch of other stuff there what is that that uh chapter six foundations of a ritual invoking and banishing middle pillar exercise so he goes through the middle pillar exercise goes through a bunch of stuff and then right at the uh, right at right at the end chapter 13 13 what's 13 in the tyro death Ooh, transformation <laughs> spiritual development that's his interpretation of the bornless ritual so literally you don't need to get any other golden dawn book just buy this book if you want to if you want to do golden dawn uh, rituals and or if you want to do the golden dawn system the neo-hermetic system of the golden dawn and just work this this is, is just a simple cheapest option i don't know maybe you want to do a woodwork course and then get real crazy and start making yourself all of the proper weapons and get your girl get your girl to do a course in sewing at an adult learning college or something and make all the vestments and have a little have a and yeah oh, and make all the like wall decorations all of the what do you call the like the flag symbols and stuff oh jesus make your own little mini temple in your house that would be based that would be kind, not gonna lie that would be kind of based but for a much smaller operation just go with this anyway so that's golden dawn and just keep that in mind the bornless ritual so the next tradition the next tradition i want to talk about is the fraternity of saturn or the fraternitas saturni as I believe uh, they call themselves. This tradition, if you haven't heard of it, if you have, you'll know where this is going, they are German. And in the same way that to what the Golden Dawn is in the English-speaking world, where everyone uses it as a backbone for their own kind of traditions, in that same way, the fraternity of Saturn is that, but for the German-speaking world. So it's this thing that's really interesting. Like, you know, we know of the Golden Dawn and all of the kind of the societies that are offshoots of the Golden Dawn because we speak English, we speak the language, we can kind of find the histories. But in think of every other country that has a different language, they will have their own secret societies with their own systems that are sometimes completely unique and different. So Italy, France, Germany, even Poland, the Czech Republic, all those other Eastern European countries. And once again, all the countries then outside of Europe will have their own systems, their own traditions. It's very fascinating. So Germany has this uh, system that's not Golden Dawn-like. The only thing that's similar to it in Golden Dawn is really uh, how uh, far and wide it's used. It's the backbone of pretty much any other German school. They use the fraternity of Saturn stuff. And most of where I'm drawing this from is this book here by Stephen Flowers, The Fratern Fraternitas of Saturn, I, Stephen Flowers very great book great intro also super short it's like barely a hundred pages i literally read this in a weekend it's fantastic and boy is that an interesting school oh my god there's also some really interesting cognates and connections with other schools that i've seen like they're very into the aquarian age the age of aquarius this new age of aquarius issues a new energy into the world and some interesting Eastern things. Like I've heard of people say, you know, back in the day uh, when stuff from the East was first getting translated, they just smashed them together. And so you get these weird schools that were like half Western ceremonial magic and then half like Kundalini yoga tantric stuff. And it's like, that's literally this. It's, they'll have like weird uh, Pankatattva five element rituals and then mix it with some Western, uh, Western elements. And it's, it's, very, it's very odd, very interesting. But they, um, I'm going to put a disclaimer here. Personally, these guys are massive black magicians. Like crazy. Oh my god. So in the fraternity of Saturn, you don't necessarily say work with angels or beings. You create beings using specific methods. And uh, yeah, he Stephen Flowers goes in and describes some of them. And, you know, uh, the literal archetype of... You know, a guy and a gal, naked, doing certain things on an altar covered in chicken blood, literally applies it. Like I'm, you know, it's YouTube, so I don't want to mention. Don't don't want to don't want to have them angry at me. But oh boy, oh boy. And in that, there's like a bit where Stephen Flowers is like, oh yeah, but they don't use in the, in modern times they don't use chi chicken blood anymore. They just use wine, and it's symbolic of the blood. And I'm like, 
Yeah, but you said in your introduction that you're not a member of any of the Fraternity of Saturn schools, so how would you know that? Like, clearly there's some... I bet you anything, man. I bet you anything, bro. There's some there's some back alley Fraternity of Saturn lodges somewhere in Germany where they're doing some crazy stuff. Jesus Christ. But their system is interesting. So, once again, layman coming in from the outside looking in, they have this really interesting thing where, of course, once again, they're Saturn. They have this uh, whole issue, love-hate relationship with Saturn, where Saturn is both the Lucifer who brings light, like this Promethean kind of archetype that gives light and fire to humanity, and is also the Demiurge at the same time that also oppresses you. So there's this force that oppresses you, uh, but on a higher octave, it's also wants to bring you light. So once again, you're very interesting little kind of things that you see. And so they had the, you know, there's Saturn and there's the sun, but really you want to go to Saturn, you want to go to the darkness, because it's within the darkness you find the true light. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, I, get, I can kind of see the mentality, like, you know, the darkness is seen as like a womb. And what comes out of a womb? Birth. So you want to go through a new birth by walking through this gate of Saturn. And it seems to me, so they say in the book, or they, he says in the book that it's like, there's this thing where what you're trying to do is you're trying to develop yourself in a way, and it's very intellectual as well. Their system, like you got to write essays to get through some of the degrees, and some of the degrees, like you got to have written four different essays and four different magical subjects. And I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ, calm down, bro. Um, but there's this work on the self, this development on the self. Maybe you create other entities for doing specific tasks or magical operations, but the work on the self is there so that when you die you pass through the gate of saturn and most people when they die they just dissolve but the idea is is when you die having done the system of the fraternity of saturn you dissolve but then recoagulate beyond the gate of death so that you are a being that is then outside of death you are then a being in the spirit world but you've recrystallized so you have all of your memories from this life You've kind of survived, uh, you know, you've kind of survived. You haven't dissipated. You're functionally immortal in an ontological spiritual sense, a metaphysical sense. You've recrystallized in the mental world. So not, it's very interesting. They talk about the astral and the mental world, and they specifically say, no, you're not in the astral world. You're in the mental world. You've crystallized yourself in the mental world, and that's where the real fraternity of Saturn is. The fraternity of Saturn is a lodge that exists in the mental world, and the people in those lodge are like immortal kind of beings that are in that world, and they communicate with the physical fraternity of Saturn lodges around the place. So all of the fraternity of Saturn lodges claim to have connections to the internal worlds, to the internal fraternity of Saturn. So that, you know, when you die, if you go through this process, when you die, you recoagulate and you become a member in the internal worlds. And the whole idea is, is the leaders of the lodges of fraternity of saturn in the physical so in the physical world the leader of that lodge is someone who's done that while living so while living they've passed they've gone through this process where they've dissolved and recoagulated themselves and they can go out in the astral and into the mental world and co communicate and continue to act and uh, connect and participate with the mysteries internally uh, even while they still have a physical body so i'm like whoa that's pretty crazy, bro. <laughs> if it wasn't for, you know, the other weird stuff, I gotta say, that's uh, that's quite attractive. That's a very uh, interesting system you've got there. So there's that. So, th so now we've got li two little things. You've got the Golden Dawn, you've got the Bornless Ritual trying to connect to this eternal thing, and then there's this other system where it's like you're trying to, you're working with something that's eternal. You're working with this Saturnian principle, but you yourself, you're trying to immortalize and kind of crystallize upwards you're trying to almost become something like that you yourself pardon me Ugh, sorry i'm just burping Oof. you yourself are trying to become that thing beyond uh death beyond this world of duality beyond this world of arising and decay and uh entropy you are trying to defeat entropy and become something eternal i am absolutely throbbing right now but let's keep going so now i want to talk about the last uh school 
shall we say. And this one I know the least about. And it's really hard to, it's, well, I won't say really hard, but once again, it's the language barrier, bruh. So, Italy. In Italy, there is a school of magic. And that school, that neo-hermetic school, that lineage, actually claims to have a lineage dating back, a continuous lineage dating back all the way to Pythagoras. And, you know, we can, we can laugh or cringe at that as much as we want, but at the same time, the founder of that school definitely didn't create that all by himself. There are definitely elements in there that are real, that are possibly from a true tradition. And it's weird. So, this Italian school is called the Magical Brotherhood of Miriam. And the your you may have you may see different names or different iterations of it. The Brotherhood of Miriam just the Brotherhood of Miriam or some or the Therapeutic Brotherhood of Miriam, sometimes they call it that. And it had different kind of orders attached to it, like the inner order, it was called like the Order of Osiris. So there was this uh, Egyptian element, the deeper you go into it. So I guess connecting to the Hermetics. But it's a neo-hermetic school nonetheless, started by Giuliano Cremires. And the first time I ever heard about this, I was reading that Giulia Savola book called... The edition I had was called The Fall of Spirituality, but I think that's a, like a, the original title when translated into English is called something like The Mask or Facade of Contemporary Spirituality. And it's basically this book where Giulia Savola is like, don't like New Ages, don't like psychoanalysis, don't like Theosophists, don't like Stein. And he basically just goes through, you know, all of modern spirituality that he doesn't like and but he goes through everybody and just like just tears them apart like these guys you know fuck these guys and i'm like well who do you like man what is good and then at the at the end of the last part of that book the final chapter he actually mentions some stuff that he does like and i was like oh, okay here we go let's see and he mentioned he actually appreciates the golden dawn he says there are elements of tradition there and he mentions gurdjieff as well i was like hell yeah gurdjieff yeah and some other things there's a a German author called Gustav Meyrink. He mentions his works. Apparently, that was his favorite author. Uh, Gustav Meyrink himself wrote novels, but they were kind of occult or esoteric novels. The um, he apparently wrote the novel The Golem, which was turned into the black and white movie The Golem. But yeah, make of that what you will. But the one that I've uh, a couple of Rosicrucians that I know have read. There's a book called The White Dominican by Gustav Meyrink, and they, you know, they all jizzed in their pants and were like it's amazing oh my god oh, you have to read it and i'm like okay well I'll, I'll get to it eventually but the um last one julius savola goes through is he says you know there's this guy juliano cremirez and i'm like Ooh, what's that and he mentions this brotherhood and he starts talking about them and i'm like hey these guys sound pretty based so i looked them up and there's only two books in english one is called uh, one's called the hermetic physician which is actually a um book on the life of Giuliano Cremieres, and it has some of his system in it. It has a couple of rituals that you would do uh, at, the, at the beginning parts of The Brotherhood of Miriam. I haven't read the book. I haven't got the book. I've listened to a couple of podcasts of the author. It looks, it looks legit. The other book that's out is, of course, this one, The Hermetic Science of Transformation. Uh, the Initiate Path of Natural and Divine Magic, Giuliano Cremieres. So this was translated or it's a bunch of different stuff. I haven't finished reading this one. Disclaimer. So everything I say may be wrong. But none, uh, and you could, the other thing is you can find some articles online, people talking about it. The, I know Pan Sophus has a really good article of someone from one of the branches or one of the offshoots. Because the same thing that happened to the Golden Dawn happened to this school. Giuliano's died. Uh, oh, yeah, Mega Mathers didn't die. But Giuliano's, after he died, the school kind of broke into a million different pieces and... Pretty much in Italy, if you go to esoteric hermetic schools, they all use the rituals of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Miriam, call themselves different things, or say that they're all legit because they all they all originally came from Cremira's school, and they all have the secret rites that they teach. They're the they're the real ones. So, what the Brotherhood of Miriam is to the Italian speaking world is what the Golden Dawn is to the English speaking world, and the Fraternity of Saturn is to the German speaking world. These are the most popular the most popular systems in each of their language groups so Cremira's had an interesting system so the whole therapeutics elements of it like why is he called the therapeutics he specifically didn't want to teach mysticism he didn't like mysticism so mysticism and magic 
uh, Dion Fortune had a really good example. She basically uh, said the difference between the occultist or the ma magician and the mystic is the mystic just wants to get off the island, just wants to evacuate, man. Hey, see ya. See ya. Whereas the occultist, the magician, wants to kind of study the world. It's almost more of a spiral path, if you will. The way Evola said it was the mystic creates something almost outside of themselves that reaches down and pulls themselves pulls them upwards just up on the path the mystic doesn't care about spiritual experiences the mystic may have spiritual experiences may have astral experiences may have uh, even faculties and gain them gain faculties and powers and whatnot but they don't care about that they just want god and nothing else which is why you never see a black mystic like you see black magicians and white magicians but there's no black and white mysticism there's, it doesn't even make sense it's just it's almost like a complete release of the willpower. Just, come, you know, Jesus, take the wheel and then just escape from reality. Um, the other side, the magician, what the magician is trying to do is trying to crystallize or incarnate or develop uh, and have something burning within them, a solar force within them that then has dominion over all of their lower nature, their thoughts, their minds, their desires, their impulses, their habits. And that's solar force then they walk on the path and then any powers that they develop are uh, connected to them so a real magician who's walking the path of magic will be able to heal people and know what to do and know how to heal people a real magician if they want to actually project they could even not just wait till night they could sit in a chair concentrate and come out into their astral body via will a mystic can't do that a mystic says you know i'll astrally project and they with faith will go to the bedchamber or when they heal people they don't know if it's going to work or not they heal with faith just pure faith is that force within them and for some people that, and that's beautiful and for some people that works for other people it's the path of the magician and juliana Ramirez, he wanted a path of magic a hermetic path but he was very wary of black magic and so he said the path of magic and developing faculties the path that least uh, uh, that's least possible to degenerate into black magic is the path of healing so if you're going to practice magic and gain magical powers gain magical powers that have to do with healing and you probably won't turn into a black magician that was the reasoning or at least that's what i understand once again not a member of any brotherhood just from the outside looking in that's what it, the logic that's what the logic appears to be so he started this uh school and it seems to have three aspects or three kind of circles going inwards uh, to, uh, from starting from the outside going inwards the outside seemed to have a more religious aspect maybe even a more mystical aspect and it was more passive the inner aspect was more psychic and active and the final the inner core the inner chamber was more alchemical and that's in it's interesting just in this title here when you see the initiatic path of natural and divine magic the natural magic comes into play obviously you don't want to do demonic magic it's natural magic you want to manipulate the what's in nature you want to manipulate the elements work in nature this is the healing this is the practice i think in what is it in the sorry the essay on pan sofas they have they talk about getting like a sigil ring that connects you to your holy guardian angel and so instead of like with the golden dawn system that's like the final thing you do with the wardenless ritual you connect to that thing whereas in the brotherhood of miriam you do that as the first thing and that is your kind of guide along the path and i was like oh that's interesting but there's this practicing of natural magic preparing yourself and then divine magic is the connection of human will and divine will of moving that uh into yourself and it's really interesting because from what i can glean from it is the ultimate the highest goal from this is to practice a type of sexual operation whether with you know a man with a priestess that then connects in a sexual uh in a sexual way but ritualized so you do not spill the energy you move the inward energy inwards and upwards and of course if you spill the energy outwards what happens you create new life you create a vessel for a new essence or if you transmute the energy inwards and upwards what happens something else is born something internally is born you create a new body but a body for something else for uh, a, a body that we can use a body in a sense like the fraternity of saturn that can survive the ray of death the, survive walking through the uh, the gate of death something that is immortal 
it's and yeah, the, it's a bit of debate whether you do this is a degenerate thing done between a man and a woman. Come on, guys, marriage is sacred. Or if it's something that a single person can achieve, or it's just using your psychic powers and trying to work with the natural energy within you, the sexual fluids within you to transmute and create that body. But nonetheless, the whole idea is you use the sexual fluid to crystallize this body, which translates as the flying body, but usually they say it's the glorious body. And it's this body that is then immortal, this body that can you can, I guess, astrally project with, go out into the internal worlds, this body that is immortal that will survive the ray of death. And there's multiple bodies. There's the one, the mercurial body, the solar body. There is, their system's very intriguing. But that's not the end of their system. The height of their system is that once you get these bodies, then you become an avatar, i.e. then you incarnate God. And this is very interesting because this is the, uh, the true esoteric Christian mysteries. Like, where's the Christ born? The Christ is born in a manger. Why? What is the manger? The manger is us uh, because it's filled with animals. What are the animals, the desires that we have? We don't need to cleanse ourselves of all desires for the Christ to incarnate within us. We just need to make room for it. But this is an, e an extra special esoteric thing. It's not just a coming down or radiating down. You're crystallizing something us up, making a new body, and then you're having God basically incarnate into you. So in a different system, in a different time, in ancient times, what would happen? You would have Osiris uh, incarnate into you or an aspect of Osiris. So his son Horus come into you. So you would become an avatar for Horus. If you're a Christian, you would say it would be the inner Christ. If you're, I don't know, in the H Hindu mysteries, or you would say it's like Vishnu within you. Uh, and it's, it's this very interesting thing. I'm like, oh, damn, that's, that's pretty epic. That's, you know, that's something. Because what do we have here? We have a connection of the two other things. Like in the Golden Dawn, you're trying to connect to that thing. Whereas in the Fraternity of Saturn, you're kind of crystallizing something to become immortal and it's like almost you're touching it but in the brotherhood of miriam you kind of have both you have this immortal body that you're creating and then you're bringing down that thing from eternity and incarnating it together and so i was like oh my god oh just two towels man i'm completely throbbing it was amazing so this is what i mean this is the importance of you know working your system working whatever school you're working with, really uh, permeating the teachings that you have that you have within yourself and working practically. But at a certain point, if you get something, if you get a little somewhere, if you get a little, little awakening, if you get some intuition, and your intuition is uh, your God speaking to you, whispering to you in your ear, that's real intuition, not false intuition, then you're often, not sent out, I should say, but then often when you look at other systems, you're able to extract what you need from them. Because everybody, you know, everybody's different. And this is the problem with systems. There's no system that's suited for everybody. Because you get a, you know, what is a system? A system is a bunch of practices, really. There's a bunch of cosmology and philosophy and theory behind them, but all of that is girded for or underpinning why uh, why you do those practices and how the practices are structured I guess but in the end the practices are a cause and they need to have an effect they need to you need to have an experience or you need to uh, uh, manifest a power that needs to be present and if it's not present then you haven't attained then you haven't done anything but here's the problem when you have a system or you know, anyone who's done any teaching ever, if you have 10 people and you all tell them the same thing and they go off and what happens when they come back? You get 10 different things, why? Everybody has different conditions. And what are those conditions? They're everything. They're our psychology, they're how we're raised, they're our star sign, they're our karma. Everything about us is conditioned by all different things. We live in a society. Society oppresses us and conditions us and it helps us grow, but it also makes us lopsided in weird ways. And so we come into a system and we develop, and some people just go into the system and they develop and they go forward. And some people stay in a system for 20 years and nothing happens. Why? You can't just say, oh, it works because I did it. It's, you know, the, 
there needs to be a teacher and there needs to be students who are so, like scattered along the paths moving forward at different speeds in different areas and if you're in a system and it doesn't work you need to contemplate you need to evaluate you need to see why isn't it working and so a part of this work of evaluation is looking at other systems contrasting to your own and to each other and trying to extract the principles trying to extract the aims and you know even the practices and the techniques trying to see what's real you're trying to find the meta system and in a sense you're trying to figure out what's wrong with yourself that then you can clear away you can then move through those conditions move through those blockages for yourself for your own sake and if your teacher or people around you are legit they'll be glad that you're doing that and if they're not well what does that say about them maybe maybe they haven't gotten anywhere maybe they're a little bit deluded maybe they've been working a system for 20 years 10 20 years and they're still mediocre and the only way to live with themselves is to be deluded and to think that they've gone to certain places on the path and if they see anyone with any inkling that the system that they're working doesn't work they rail against them and rage at them online or to their face don't talk to those people just smile and walk away we want something real and yeah you know black magicians exist yeah there's weird people who have weird experiences experiences and powers aren't necessarily a sign of spiritual attainment or ascension or initiation but no powers and no experience are definitely signs of no attainment so the founders of these systems are always usually commendable Cremires, he seems like a great guy he seems like a cool dude the people who then represent the tradition years later sometimes they're all right but what do we want we want what's real so let's engage this is just anyway so yeah this has just been this little my little uh my little survey of some neo-hermetic traditions i'm sure there's other schools out there i don't know maybe you know more than me uh about the stuff that i've talked about hey put it down in the comments let's talk about it tell me some schools that you know of i don't know i, I want to know about what's in like poland i want to know about you know franz baden's secret czech initiate initiation circle i want to know about all those guys i want to know all of the systems see what they did see how they did it did they develop did they succeed did they not sometimes a master develops himself but then he kind of fails to train his students weirdly like what's up what happened let's study these stories for the sake of ourselves for the sake of our own attainment and the people who come after us come on man let's do it let's do it let's maybe the real hermetic initiation are the friends we made along the way